All right, the attendance is running. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Questions before I begin. All right. I want to begin by sort of summarizing our first two classes um, and maybe trying to put these various doctrines together. Um, when we're talking about the free speech clause, there's a number of different questions to think about. Right. One question is, is what we're talking about actually speech? Right. Not everything is speech. Lawyers often try to say, I'm engaging in speech. So the obvious candidates, things like words, the written word, right, the spoken word, okay, that's speech. What about when we start talking about conduct? Right. When is conduct speech. This brings into play the O'Brien test. Right? The O'Brien test focuses on when we're not talking about pure speech, instead we're talking about conduct that has sort of speech wound into it. So for example, draft card burning, right? If Mr. O'Brien wanted to go out and criticize the war, he could have done that. But he chose another act of lighting the draft card on fire. So was lighting the draft card on fire speech? No. But it was conduct that we call expressive. You often see the courts describe it as expressive conduct, right? That is conduct that expresses a message. The same for Mr. Johnson, who was burning the American flag. Was he engaging in speech? Well, he might have been saying words, but that's not why he was arrested. The act of burning the flag was deemed expressive conduct. Then we get to RAV versus St. Paul, the, the cross burning case. Was that expressive speech? Now, to be sure, right? We know what the message was in O'Brien, he was opposing the war, right? And we know what the message was in Johnson. He was opposing the Republican platform by trying to burn an American flag. What was the message being expressed in RAV? I mean, he wasn't really making a political statement, wasn't opposing a war or opposing any sort of political party. Uh, I mean, we can't just write a bunch of dumb teenagers, but he was expressing a rather hateful message, right? To intimidate a black family by bringing a cross in their lawn. So you say, wait a minute, Josh, isn't that, you know, how is that expressive conduct? Um, under the law, expressing hateful messages is speech. And this was one of the points in RAV. If the law allows you to say, I love people of all races, the law also allows you to say, I hate people of certain races, right? The government can't sort of pick and choose which message that you're allowed to convey. So, so far I've described the threshold question of is there actually speech involved? And under the modern doctrine, speech can be very broad and it's so called expressive conduct. Okay. The next sort of lens you have to think about these issues is what category of speech are you engaging in? It's sometimes called the categorical approach. Um, and over the last, you know, 120 odd years, the Supreme Court has created different categories of speech. Um, the first such case we talked about is Chaplinsky, right? Chaplinsky said that the certain categories of speech that have no presence in the First Amendment. And it mentioned, among others, the lewd, the obscene, the profane. Libel, 
and fighting words. And I'll just focus on two of those, the last two. Uh, it's always been the case that defamation, that libel, has not been protected by the First Amendment, right? I have no right to defame you. That is, speak falsely about you in a way that harms your character. You learn this in torts. And in Chaplinsky, the court also recognizes a cult, the so-called fighting words doctrine. This is the notion that if you engage in speech that's so hostile, so harsh that it can bring people to blows, um, that is not speech that receives protection by the First Amendment. In other words, the entire category, the entire category of fighting words is like sort of outside the scope of the First Amendment. Same for defamation. There's no balancing. There's no strict scrutiny. There's no intermediate scrutiny. It's just like outside the scope of the First Amendment. Okay, but just be careful. Don't forget what, what RAV said. RAV said the government can prohibit fighting words, but they can't prohibit fighting words from a particular viewpoint. That is, you can't only, you know, you're allowed to have fighting words but against people who have disabilities, but you can't have fighting words on people on the basis of race. That is impermissible. All right. Why? Here's a third lens. So again, the first lens was, are we dealing with actual speech? All right. The second lens is, what sort of category are we in? The third lens is, what type of restriction of speech is there? Is it a form of content? Based restriction, content based restriction, or is it a form of viewpoint, viewpoint based discrimination? Both of these are very bad, right? Government generally can't get away with content based restrictions, and they can't get away with viewpoint based descriptions. So, you know, maybe I'll give you an easy example of a content based description. Uh, content-based discrimination, I'm sorry, content-based discrimination. Let's say it's in the middle of the war. The government says, you cannot publish any material about the war, period. doesn't matter whether you're for the war or against the war. You can't write about the war. That's the law. Okay. That's a straight-up content-based restriction, and it, at least under modern doctrine, is almost certainly unconstitutional. All right. Content-based restrictions are bad. They're very suspicious because you're basically telling people what they can and cannot talk about. But let's say you have a different law. Let's say the law says you cannot criticize the war. You can praise it, right? You can celebrate the war. You can say, go USA, we have a flag, right? But you can't criticize the war. That is no longer a content-based restriction. That is now a viewpoint based discrimination because the government is discriminating on the basis of your viewpoint your point of view you can praise the war you cannot criticize the war um, in many ways the case that we studied the first week of class shank and debs and abrams were viewpoint discrimination right if you were all patriotic and uncle sam you were good right you could say whatever you want but if you came out and you opposed the war and criticized the war you go to jail so as bad as content-based restrictions are Viewpoint based, um, viewpoint based discrimination is even worse, right? As a general rule, when the government discriminates on the basis of viewpoints, unconstitutional. It is very hard for a viewpoint based discrimination law to survive. And that was sort of the basis of the majority opinion of RAV versus St. Paul that you, were, you could not excite anger, or I'm sorry, you could not elicit anger by engaging this hateful speech. But if you want to celebrate diversity and say this is great, you were allowed to. Right. All right. So we have, you know, I'll just put these on the board just so we have sort of these lenses. Right. So the first question is, is this speech uh, or is it expressive conduct? Right. These are some of the questions to think about. The second is what we call the categorical approach. Right. Uh, is this libel? Is this fighting words? Uh, another category is unlawful incitement under Brandenburg. Oops, I can't spell today. Right. We'll do a bunch of these sort of categorical cases throughout the semester. But you can just start you know, your list here. Right. Certain categories simply are, are protected. If you engage in an unlawful incitement to violence, too bad. You're not protected. Um, another approach is we ask something content based discrimination or viewpoint uh, based discrimination. I can't spell incitement. I'm sorry.
All right. We ask ourselves, in what basis is um, the court? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what basis is the government discriminating on content or viewpoint? Everyone with me so far? Question so far. I'm trying to synthesize like two classes, and so we're getting pretty messy, isn't it? Preview of this course. All right. And then there's a fourth sort of lens, which we're not quite ready to talk about, uh, but I can sort of just introduce it, which is the question of scrutiny. Now, you've all taken for uh, con law, right? You remember the concept of scrutiny. All right. So what is scrutiny? It's a concept people talk about. They don't really understand. What scrutiny is asking is how closely do we review, do we scrutinize some governmental action? When you say strict scrutiny, what does that mean? You're looking at the government act very closely. And you're trying to figure out, is what the government says they're doing actually what they're doing? In other words, the government says we want to accomplish X. Does this law actually accomplish X? Then you have what might be called a rational base scrutiny. And what's rational basis saying? It's like, well, the government says they're doing X, and well, the law doesn't really do X, but it's close enough, so good enough, we'll uphold the law, right? Scrutiny is really a question of determining, is the government doing what they say they're doing, or might the government be doing something else? Sometimes what's called a pretext. The idea that they're giving you one reason, but they're really doing something else, right? And so with the First Amendment, generally, you're going to have strict or intermediate scrutiny. Um, there are some instances where there's rational basis scrutiny. In the First Amendment, it's actually very rare. It involves commercial speech. We'll talk about it later this semester. But most restrictions on speech fall somewhere between strict and intermediate scrutiny. Now, if you're going to hate me for this, the tests for First Amendment scrutiny are different than the tests for due process equal protection scrutiny. They're different, I'm sorry. You've all memorized a million times, narrowly tailored to serve compelling governmental interest, substantially related to serve an important governmental interest, right? You've, you've memorized these tests, they're different, I'm sorry. Um, so even though you might see the word intermediate scrutiny in this class, it will not have the same meaning as intermediate scrutiny in con law. It's in the ballpark, right? It's related. Strict scrutiny is more rigorous than intermediate scrutiny. No question, right? But one of the challenges is how to decide which type of scrutiny you're going to apply. So I'll give you, I'll give you an easy one, right? If there's a content-based restriction or a viewpoint-based description, sorry, if there's a content or viewpoint-based discrimination, you're almost certainly going with strict scrutiny, right? That's not a 100% rule, but that will get you where you need to go, right? If the government wants to say, We'll let you celebrate the war but not criticize it. You are going to strict scrutiny land. That, land, that law is not going to survive. If there's a content-based restriction, that is probably almost certainly going to be strict scrutiny. I won't say always, but that's going to be the case. All right. But what about the O'Brien test, right? Our, our test from last week, the flag burning case, right? Um, Let's just review, review the O'Brien test, right? Um, the O'Brien test is sort of like intermediate scrutiny. And let me just explain why. What are the elements, right? Again, there were four elements. Three of them really don't matter. But the first two don't matter. Three and four kind of matter. So what's the third element of O'Brien? We ask, is the governmental interest unrelated to the suppression of free speech. In other words, are you banning the burning of draft cards because of free speech? Or are you banning the draft cards for some other reason, right? What is the reason why you're banning the draft card burning? Is that reason related to the suppression of free speech? This is more or less the question of, of uh, narrowly tailored or substantially related, right? In intermediate scrutiny, we ask, is the means substantially related to the ends, okay? What is the government's stated purpose of banning the draft card burning? To keep records. What are the means they use to preserve records? And you can't ban the draft card. So at least in O'Brien, they said there was a relationship between the means, banning the burning, and the ends, keeping records. 
Now go to Johnson. What is the government's interest in Johnson? Promoting patriotism, right? Ensuring that people have respect for the flag and so on. That's not a valid interest. Really what they're doing is they're trying to stop people from speaking against the government. So there is no relationship, I'm sorry, there's a relationship between the government's interest and suppressing free speech. Why? The government's interest is suppressing free speech. So when you think of the O'Brien test, and in particular the third factor, it's you have to look at the relationship between the government's, the government's interest and suppression of free speech, right? That's really the question of relatedness and intermediate scrutiny, right? How closely related is what the government's doing to what they say they're doing? How closely related is the restriction to the actual government's interest? Get with me. And then what's the fourth O'Brien test? It's whether the incidental restriction is no greater than is essential. That's the question of tailoring, right? Tailoring. The first question is how closely related is the means and the ends? The second question is how narrowly tailored is the law? There might be lots of ways to prevent government records from being destroyed, making duplicates and so on. There are lots of ways to avoid you know, people burning stuff on the street. You don't need to ban flag burning in particular. So the third and the fourth elements of the O'Brien test more or less mirror the concept of intermediate scrutiny. It's not exactly what we learned last semester in con law, but it's pretty darn close. Now, why are we using intermediate scrutiny for the O'Brien test? Here's the trick. We're not talking about speech, we're talking about conduct. When it's a restriction on conduct, expressive conduct, we go to O'Brien and we do intermediate scrutiny. When it's a restriction on actual speech, like words and the like, we use strict scrutiny. That's not always the rule, though. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because didn't I tell you that in RV versus St. Paul, there was a viewpoint discrimination. So here's how you link it, right? When you have a restriction that is related to the suppression of free speech, in other words, when the government's interest is suppressing free speech, you don't apply the O'Brien test. This is what makes the O'Brien test so tricky. You only apply the O'Brien test as you only apply intermediate scrutiny when the government is not suppressing free speech. It, 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 it's bizarre. I, I taught this case a hundred times. I still never do quite right. The O'Brien test is where deciding, do we apply strict scrutiny or do we apply intermediate scrutiny? If you check all the boxes in the O'Brien test and you say, yes, the O'Brien test is appropriate, then it's basically from intermediate scrutiny. But if the regulation is related to the suppression of free speech, you go to strict scrutiny. So the O'Brien test is, is a test, but it's also kind of a gatekeeper. It tells you which format to apply, which framework to apply. I know what I said is very confusing, and I apologize. Um, but the O'Brien test is generally used to decide what type of scrutiny we're going to use, and then you actually apply it. So when you have a viewpoint-based description on expressive conduct, you do strict scrutiny. That's RAV. But when it's a viewpoint neutral restriction on conduct, like an O'Brien, you do intermediate scrutiny. I know that made absolutely no sense. You, you, your eyes are rolling, right? I'm sorry. It, it, trust me, it, it's not me. Uh, I'll, I'll try this again. The O'Brien test is kind of like a filter, right? To decide, are we going to apply strict scrutiny? Or we're going to apply intermediate scrutiny. Let me put the O'Brien test up here in full. Okay. What this is telling you, if three and four, if the answer to three and four are yes, the O'Brien test is the right framework, you apply intermediate scrutiny. The law will probably survive. If the answer to three or four is no, then the O'Brien test is not for you. Even though it's a restriction of, con of expressive conduct, you are still engaging in suppression of free speech, you go to strict scrutiny. 
save us, Julian. Okay, um, so in terms of like working through the analysis for exam purposes, so you start using the O'Brien test, see if that third element is met or not, and then you're on the right track. Yeah, it, it, you're very close. Um, here's what I would say. When you look at a free speech problem, that's what I'm trying to tell you, these kind of lenses, the ways of looking at it. There are a lot of things you have to think about. So first off, you have, right, are we dealing with speech or expressive conduct? And by the way, what I'm telling you is what will go even worse next week. So this will make sense for this week, it'll get worse next week. This, I love this class, but I hate it because it's so complicated. The first thing that you start thinking about is what are we talking about? What is the nature of the expression? Is it speech, words, whatever? If it's a restriction on speech, words, then that's easy, right? You don't have to worry about the O'Brien test. But if we're talking about expressive conduct, right? Burning of the flag, burning of the draft card, burning of the cross, and so on. That is not going to be the same ballpark as expressive conduct. I'm sorry, as speech, it's expressive conduct. We have to then think about you know, this probably won't come up very much, but imagine your uh, your expressive conduct is a, a fighting word. Right? You know, imagine you go up to a, a veteran who serves in the war, and then you burn a flag right from his face. It's expressive conduct might also be fighting words. So, you know, you can mix and match, right? It's not an example that you think of very often, but you can imagine someone who served in the war, maybe lost a lot of friends. You go up to them and burn a flag in their face. That might become fighting words. So even though it's expressive conduct, it might be outside the scope of the uh, First Amendment altogether. I'm trying to think of an example of expressive conduct that's defamatory. I can't quite think of what that might be, but maybe there's an example. I can't think of one on the spot. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll come to me later. But yeah, burning a flag. Or, you know... Um, I don't go to a Jewish person burning Israeli flag in their face, right? It's expressive conduct, but also might be fighting words, right? You also have to think about, is what the government doing, is the law they're enforcing, is it content-based or viewpoint-based? So again, imagine it's like RAV. If you want to say that you know every race is awesome, diversity is amazing, that's fine. But if you say race is bad, that might be a viewpoint-based discrimination. So it's almost like three-dimensional or four-dimensional chess, right? There's many different ways to approach the same question. So now I get to the fourth question, one that that, that, that Julianne asked me at a moment ago, is the question of scrutiny. If we're talking about as a restriction on speech, straight up, straight up speech, you're going to be in strict scrutiny. There's not going to be much wiggle room on that one. But if it's expressive conduct, it could be intermediate or strict. And what determines whether it's intermediate or strict is O'Brien, right? O'Brien's kind of the filtering device that if you check yes to three, yes to four, then you're going to do the intermediate O'Brien test. If you if you say no to those elements, then you probably go to strict scrutiny land and you're viewed very rigidly. Does that make a little sense? Yeah. I think I got that right. Jacob, if, I'm sorry. It, it, this is I, it, There's a reason why I haven't even talked about the new material because I, I, I deliberately said, Josh, first 20 minutes, I'm just going to review this and make sure it makes sense for my students. Yeah. Mine is real quick. Yes, so, sir. You said generally if it's expressive conduct, generally going to be intermediate scrutiny. Unless there's a straight up viewpoint discrimination on that. that, that that's the burning the flag in someone's face thing, yeah. Right, so you go to the O'Brien test, and then it seems like that third factor, whether it furthers a government interest. Unrelated, yeah. Whether or yeah. If, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, whether it's un unrelated to the suppression of free speech. So that almost seems like, are they trying to limit, or I'm sorry, right. what, what's the words of, about the viewpoint? Right. Are, are, are they actually trying to accomplish the goal of, you know, preventing uh, uh, government, preserving government records, or are they just trying to sh uh, clamp down on dissent? And if they are, then it's strict speech. I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm saying I think because this is, this is not an area of the law that is developed in a sort of coherent fashion. It wasn't like someone said, all right, you know what? We're going to write a First Amendment case law. We're going to do it in one sitting and kind of just, you know, lay it down. On it's not like, you know, the restatement of torts. Right, where you know you know what the four elements of battery are, right? Four elements, I don't even know, right? But you you know what the elements of a tort are. Here, this is law that was developed over the course of you know 100 years, incrementally by different judges of different philosophies, and putting it all together, um, it's not always pleasant. So I, this lovely four 
list is not going to make any, we'll, we'll break apart next week. What about the future interests? This is like, kind of like future interests, right? We're just sort of layered on top of each other. And eventually the charts just break, right, Julianne? Eventually the charts give way. I can give you a chart now. It's going to be worse the week after. But at least you get where we are now without talking about a new material. If you don't get it, just fine. Seriously, this is not easy. If you don't, if you don't get it, please ask me to repeat it. Anyone? Yeah, Shania. Shania, Shania I'm sorry. I said, I said your name right. It's been excellent so far. No, I, no I, I, I was like, Shania. Don't say Shania. Okay. I just want to make sure. When you're talking about expressive conduct, when analyzing it, we're supposed to be using that test from um, Texas v. Johnson when they talk about like communicative elements in the message. Right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even... I didn't even talk about that part, but, but you're exactly right. Right. Expressive conduct, right? How do you know something's expressive conduct, right? Um, you know, I could, I'm not going to do it, but a person lifts up their middle finger, right? That is conduct. You are extending a finger, but you're also <laughs> expressing a message with that finger, right? Burning a flag is clearly expressive conduct. Um, uh, burning a draft card is expressive conduct. I think everyone, the government agreed to that in the, in the, the O'Brien case. But, you know, what about something that's not so expressive and, and uh, not to use an example, pornography, right? Uh, I'm getting myself in trouble. Pornographic actors engaging in intercourse on the screen. I said that right, okay? They say, we are engaging in expressive conduct. Really, what... What what message are you conveying? There's a oh god, I'm in trouble. Ever watch Family Guy? There's a there's an episode where there's a cutaway where um uh, there's a man talking to a prostitute and he's giving her money to have sex, and the cops walk in and say you're under arrest for prostitution. It's like no, we're not. We're filming pornography. And there's a camera there. It's like oh never mind, you're fine. In other words, the exact same act of hiring someone to have sex with you is illegal if it's prostitution. But if it's deemed expressive, it becomes protected by the First Amendment. Go figure. So um, the what, what, what Shania asked me about a minute ago, the discussion from Texas against Johnson about having communicative elements or elements that communicate is important to decide if it's actually expressive. Because a lot of times people engage in acts, usually involving sex, which is what it comes up also, that's expressive. You know, for example, let's say... Uh, this comes up a lot. You know, the church of marijuana, right? People say, oh, this is my church, right? And I'm going to light a joint in front of City Hall to express my religion. Well, yeah, maybe you're maybe you're smoking marijuana in front of City Hall, but maybe you're just you're, you're a stoner and you're smoking pot, right? So you have to see, is this actually communicative or are you just using the First Amendment as a shield against prosecution when it's fake? Does that make a little sense? Yeah. All right. Everyone with me? All right. All right. Do yourselves a favor and just sort of go back and look at these four things and just try and realize that you can approach the same question from like four different angles, like 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 uh, Abraham's tent, right? There's four four entry points, right? And depending which entry point you come in, you might have to leave from a different different exit point. From pornography to Abraham figures. Um, why not? Uh, <laughs> I love my job. You can tell. All right, any more questions? This can go on to the new stuff. All right, um, so last week we sort of discussed when is conduct speech, right? Again, burning draft cards, burning flags, burning crosses. When is conduct speech? The topic for today is about money. Is money speech. So before we even get into the materials, right, um, you know, we have Buckley, we have uh, McConnell versus FEC, and then we have um, Citizens United versus FEC. Okay. Amy, why wouldn't, or, or why would, maybe I'll ask both ways, Amy, is giving money to a political cause expressive conduct under the O'Brien standard. Yeah, go for it. Please go ahead. Actually, this is not even the, the it's actually the question I gave me a minute ago. 
is this expressive conduct? In other words, is writing a check to a political candidate expressive conduct that will be governed by the O'Brien test? I don't know. It's a difficult thing. I know. That's why I asked. That's why I asked you. Just first principles. It's, it's not in your notes. It is, Amy, let me ask you a question like this, maybe a little bit easier. Does giving money resemble speaking in a soapbox, say up in a soapbox, or does giving money, writing a check resemble burning a draft card? Or where does that fit? Maybe it's a more effort to change. Why, why? You seem uncertain. Why, why, why are you uncertain? Into, like, okay, so let's easy one, right? Let's say I go to a rally, hold up a sign, says "Vote for Jones." Is that speech? Yes. No, there's not conduct. That's straight up speech, right? You know, I go to I go to a, a political forum. I say I endorse Jones for president. Is that speech? Yes. Okay. So how about instead of writing "I endorse Jones" on a sign, I can write on a check <laughs> "Jones" and I endorse the check. Yes. And that's what I did there, right? <laughs> Right. What, what, what's the difference between writing Jones in a placard and writing Jones in a check followed by a dollar number? Really nothing. Really nothing. Hmm. Jonathan, what do you think? What's the difference between, again, writing on a, a sign, Jones, that's all I write, Jones, that's my sign, versus writing on a check followed by some numbers, Jones? Um. My gut just goes to the uh, the fact that you're fully uh, supporting somebody and it's having a material. Wait a minute. Let me let, let me try this differently. Let's try. Let's get in a minute. Let's try it differently, right? Um, so I hold up a sign that says Jones, right? Where did the that placard appear from? Did it appear, did it appear thin air? Did that sign just magically appear? Uh, no, it was created. I mean, does the people does paper just constantly does paper grow on trees? It actually kind of does. <laughs> but does the the signs just magically appear in my backyard? Where do I have to get a sign? Buy it, and what's it take to buy something? Currency. Currency. I was going to ask: Is the difference the um, the one is expressed and one is implied? Like when you give someone money, you don't tell them that you want them to spend it. Oh, you tell them. You ever, you ever make a political donation? Let me tell you, my friend. You go to a political fundraiser and you hand them your check. You are going to tell them exactly what you think. In fact, the reason why politicians hold fundraisers is that regular citizens can see them face to face and say, here's my support, by the way, X, Y, Z. Oh, that's, but but you're right. When you hold up a sign, you're making a public statement that I support Jones, versus when you hide him a check at a fundraiser, it's not, maybe. Let me go back to the question, uh, Anna, let me, let me just follow the thread, right? Um, we already agreed that if you wanna make a sign, right, you need money. Right, ink, right, markers, the little wooden poles, things you hold up, right? That doesn't just magically appear. You have to you have to pay for that. So my question to you, Anna, again, is what's the difference between holding up a sign saying Jones, which you pay money for, and writing a check for say one dollar to Jones? I mean, for all we know, the the placard costs more than a one dollar donation or contribution. What's the difference? I feel like it has to do with like I, the business, in the sense of thinking that you're getting something in return, like if I'm paying for the sign, I'm getting the sign in return, and that's not like that just doesn't feel expressive. Why, why does it matter if you get something in return? Why does that make a difference? Why, why should it make any difference if you get something in return? I guess. I mean, if you want to be if you want to be abstract, if you support a candidate and he gets into office, you're gonna get something in return. You get legislation you like, or you'll get policies adopted that you favor. That's hell of a lot more valuable than a piece of cardboard. I guess it's just like a business intent of when you're buying the cardboard versus if I'm like when I'm actually using the cardboard. Oh, so with the card, you, you you're certain to get the cardboard, but your guy has to win to get the policy results, right? Or at least he has to win and deliver on on, on promises, promises made, promises kept, right? Adi, let me ask you the, the, the really a question, right? Why is it that putting up a placard that says Jones is obviously speech, but signing a check 
to Jones might not be, might be expressive conduct. Or is it not? I don't know. I think it is expressive conduct because you're communicating a message. What message? When you write a check to Jones, what message are you kind of communicating? Your support or that you want. Well, it's clearly your support. You could also like be wanting them to do something for you, but you're you're communicating something in the same way that like. I just, How do I'm people just, know? I mean, if you only have a sign saying Jones, people know that, right? If you write a check to Jones, will people know that? Jones may. Jones might know about it, but would <laughs> anyone else might know about it? If you have to be disclosed. Ooh, so so uh, now you, you see where I'm leading, right? Is making a political contribution expressive conduct if no one sees it but the donee, the politician? In other words, if the only person who knows about it is the person who writes the check, the person who cashes the check, how is it expressive? Well, it could still be expressive, like because it. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be not expressive if I told Anna something and only Anna heard. Right, but but that's the communication to Anna. I'm talking about the act of writing the check itself. So until he gets it, then you're saying right. Again, I write a check. Two people know. I wrote the check. He cashes it. That's two people know. Have I expressed a message? If no, you know, if that's like yelling in a field that no one hears you, right? Does it make a sound? If he hasn't, if the person you're giving the check to, hasn't he knows you got it. He he cashed it. He cashed it right away. If he hasn't, but no one else knows. Who are you expressing the message to? Just the one politician. Nick, do you, do you think? Uh, Nick, do you think is it a question or you want to answer it? I was gonna say, um, does it matter how many people are around? So just... Two people. Make my question real easy. You go to a fundraiser. You talk to him, you put it quietly in his hand, you put a check, and then that's it. No one ever sees it happen. Trust me, this happens every day. You guys have been to political fundraisers? Am I exaggerating? <laughs> yeah, this is, what, this is what goes on. So, Nick, let me ask you the question, right? Is giving money a form of expressive conduct? Or is it just speech itself? I mean, I, I think it's expressive conduct. So does the O'Brien test, does Citizens United even mention O'Brien? Uh, well, it does. But... No, so what's up? Didn't I just tell you that O'Brien's a standard for expressive conduct? That that means, so so is, are political contributions expressive conduct? What does the court say about this? They, they say political speech. Ooh, we got another category, don't we? Yeah, we got these categories. Go back up here, we got... See, I told you this list is going to just become absolute garbage in a few minutes, right? So, yeah. So the five of you, thank you very much for indulging my thought experiment. Um, you might think after reading O'Brien that a political contribution is expressive conduct. That is the act of writing the check is designed to convey a message, that there's speech bound up with it. But the courts haven't done that. The courts seem to have another category of what they call political speech. And it's specifically not holding up a sign at a rally or saying a soapbox or endorsing your candidate. It's giving money or things of value. I mean, you give gold bricks if you want, but I mean, still, 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 still giving things of value. And since Buckley, the courts have held consistently that political speech in the form of contributions is speech right it is speech and there's an entirely separate set of rules that govern political speech and i had you read today i didn't give you all of buckley buckley is a it's like a like hundreds of pages it's a ridiculously long case I gave you which is a very small excerpt but if you read buckley you read mcconnell and you read Citizens United, you might ask yourself, Josh, what's the test? I'm like, I don't know. Because the, the, the cases don't reconcile. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't cohere with each other. We'll go through them, I promise, as carefully as I can. But it's not like there's a single test. And again, and Buckley was decided only a couple of years after O'Brien. They were pretty close in time. And the court didn't go down the expressive conduct route. So the short answer is speech is not expressive conduct. I'm sorry, political contributions are not expressive conduct. All right, everyone with me so far? 
Gui du Buckley. Okay. Uh, so, um, who is Buckley? Um, you may have heard of William F. Buckley, who was a founder of National Review, or not. Very famous conservative magazine. Uh, his brother, James Buckley, was a remarkable human being. Uh, he was a senator from New York on the conservative ticket, later became a federal judge. I met him oh, about two years ago. I, was like, I, I started geeking out, saying, I teach your case in con law. I totally geeked. I don't geek out often. But I geeked out. He died at the age of either 99 or 100 in the last year or so. He uh, lived a remarkable life. Um, so sorry, sorry we lost him also. Uh, but I got, I got to meet him very quickly. So he, he was at a reception. I shook his hand. I said, oh, I teach your case, Buckley. Uh, anyway, he's a great guy. Vallejo was, I think, the, uh, was the sergeant at arms and the doorkeeper of the, of the house. So not as famous, but Buckley was famous. Um, Buckley considered the validity of what's called FICA which is the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971. This was a law that was designed to regulate what's often called campaign finance. That is the way that campaigns, political campaigns are financed. And the law drew a distinction between two types of giving money, contributions and expenditures. Contributions, and expenditures. Uh, Cody, help us out, please. What is the difference between a contribution and an expenditure? Um, contribution is money given to a campaign. Okay, yes. A contribution is a straight up check which you write to a candidate, right? I am giving Jones for Senate, you know, uh, you know, thousand dollars, whatever it is, right? You know. It's a contribution because the money is being sent to the candidate directly or his campaign. Okay, Cody, what is an expenditure? Um, the money that they're spending on the political campaign. How is it different from a contribution? Um, I guess it's like whenever you're, I guess the way I look at it, a contribution is like here's the gold cash, and then the expenditure is yes. spending time to do things. Just money to put hmm. Dylan, how would you distinguish them? I agree. The students always have trouble with this distinction. It's the source. So one's coming from the from the perspective donating to the campaign, and one's coming from the candidate to spend on the campaign. Okay, so uh, that's close. All right. So a contribution is when you basically give a candidate a thousand dollars and say, "You can spend this however you want." An expenditure might be, I'm going to pay for an airplane that the candidate can use, right? You're not giving, you're not directly giving the candidate cash in his pocket. Instead, you're spending money on behalf of a candidate. Or another example might be, I'm going to run a commercial on the TV or radio in support of the candidate, right? Or I'm going to put a newspaper ad in support of the candidate. Or I'm going to print up pamphlets or flyers in support of the candidate, right? You're spending money on behalf of the campaign, but you're not actually giving any money to the campaign. Everyone see that distinction? So, I mean, now it's always obvious you see on TV. This ad was paid for by, by you know, by, by Ted Cruz for Senate, right? Okay, that's going to be, money for that was contributions. Versus, this ad was paid for by friends of Ted Cruz, right? That's going to be an expenditure, right? Because Cruz, or wherever the candidates didn't get the money himself, instead it was given to an outside group. Or, you know, the Republican Party of Texas might run an ad in support of Cruz, or whoever it happens to be, whatever candidate you want. Okay. All right, so we're going to see the distinction between the, the contributions and expenditures. All right. So after FICA was announced, it goes to the court. So again, Jacob, did the court apply the O'Brien test in the in the in the um, uh, Buckley case? I won't say no. But yeah. How come? They said that the acts were not like burning a flag. They were used for the draft card. Yeah, I knew what you meant. Yeah. 
But why? I mean, I know Chief Justice Berger said that, but but this is a question for my, 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 my row of victims over here. Why is writing a check to a candidate different than burning a draft card? Because, I guess because there's no expression. You know, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, as a practical matter, if I'm writing a check to someone, that means I support them, doesn't it? Is that an act of support? Yeah, I, I would say so. So, yeah. So, I mean, look, I always get this question. You know, you could probably say that political speech, political contributions are a form of expressive conduct, but the court doesn't go down the road. Instead, the court applies some sort of unknown test that really approximates strict scrutiny. Right. Again, had this been expressive conduct under O'Brien, it would probably be stuck with intermediate scrutiny. But said the court does something closer to strict scrutiny. They don't quite say it outright, but it's strict scrutiny. All right. So Shania, help us out here. Did the court? How did the court treat the limitation on contributions? The court said that the limits on contributions. On Contributions was constitutional because of the of Oh, you got to help me out here. What, what, what is this corruption? What, what are they talking about here? I think that comes from you know we have a big corporation basically pouring. Or individuals, not just corporations, even individuals. That's true. I always forget. That's okay. When you have them pour so much money into your campaign, they might have more of an influence over you and your decisions than someone who's giving like ten dollars. But what does it mean, corruption or the appearance of corruption? What does it actually mean? I think that just goes to trying to maintain a image of our political process that some everyone has an equal voice and that some people don't have more of an equal voice. What does corruption mean? Uh, corruption. I'm sure you see this word all the time. What does corruption mean? You're acting improperly. You have naive, you have improper motives. But what would it mean for a just use an example, someone hands a suitcase full of cash to a politician, right? What would the politician have to then do for that to be corrupt? What, 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 I mean, just give me an example of what might happen. Like if I'm an oil tycoon and I hand you a billion dollars, I want you to sign off on fracking. Good. Right. So you've heard the expression quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, often a physical bribery, right? I give, you give, right? I give you this massive suitcase full of cash, and then you use your governmental power to favor my agenda through legislation or otherwise, right? That's your corruption. Right? Again, you might call it vote buying, right? Where I go to a politician and say, I will give you a million dollars if you vote in favor of this bill. Your other constituents be damned. I'm going to give you a million dollars. Yes, sign me up. Give me a million bucks, all right? That's straight up corruption, right? That's illegal. You can't do that. But the court didn't just discuss actual corruption, Kevin. They also discussed the appearance of corruption. Kevin, what is the difference between corruption? And the appearance of corruption. Help us out here. Hmm. No, I think you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Give it a moment. Just run it through. Um, Diminish people's faith in what? Faith in the institution of government. Uh, what's sort of fair or reasonable? Good. Effectively attacking people's perception of the Constitution rather than the Constitution itself. Yeah, I like the way you put it in terms of uh, uh, diminishing their faith. I actually like the way you phrased that. I think that's good. It's good framing. So what the court's basically saying is. People have to think their system is fair, right? People have to think their system is just, that the way to achieve legislation is to have popular support and get elected the ballot, right? And we like to think that politicians are elected to serve the public interest and not just the interests of the wealthy and the few. 
So even if there's no quid pro quo bribery, if it even appears that that could happen, right? There's an appearance that you have that sort of corruption. That's too much, right? You can't do that. All right, everyone with me on this one? Um, so the court upheld those two uh, on those grounds. If there's corruption, the appearance of corruption. Eric, why are the contributions... Oh, let me ask the question differently. Eric, why do the contributions create the appearance of corruption? In other words, why would really high dollar contributions create the appearance of corruption? Well, I think inherently they have more value. Um, so they might, in terms of appearance, they would appear to weigh more heavily on the beneficiary's mind. Well, I make sure. Right. So, so again, let's just say I give a politician a dollar, make it really easy. Would anyone in the world think that a dollar? Is going to sway the person's vote and make them, you know, vote the way I'm going to vote. But you have a million dollars. How about that? Closer. Yeah, I give ten million dollars. So pretty good. Yeah. So what the court's saying is, uh, once you reach a certain threshold, right, a cap, if you will, that that dollar amount is enough. For people to say, wait a minute, how much money did you give that guy? How much did you give the politician? And, and, and what do you expect to get in return? That is why the court upheld the contributions limit. Um, in current value, it was at $2,700. Uh, you can get up to $2,700 per candidate per election cycle. Um, does anyone think that, and honestly, $2,700 will make a difference most politicians? I can tell you it does not. You might get a photo op. That's about all you'll get out of it. Uh, I'm serious. Um, but the court said Congress's judgment was reasonable. And because of the appearance of corruption, Congress can reasonably impose a cap. All right, so that is the contribution limit. Questions? Questions. All right, Jamar, help us out. The other limit was a limit on expenditures. What did the court do with the expenditure limit? Uh, did the court uphold or declare unconstitutional the limit on independent expenditures? Okay, tell me why, please. Uh, these provisions place substantial and direct restrictions on the ability of candidate citizens. In your own words, please. Um, they overruled it because. It appears to be corruption. No, no, no. I'm talking about the independent expenditures, not contributions. Why the court uphold? Why the court halt the ex the limit on expenditures? What's the difference, Jamar, between the expenditures and the contributions? Why are they different? Um, an expenditure is restricted cash, and the contribution mm -hmm. is unrestricted. I think you might have inverted it. Who gets the money with the contribution? The, the person who gets the money with the contribution. Who's the person? The candidate. Okay. With a candidate writing a check, I'm sorry, with a contribution, you write a check to the candidate. Who gets the money with an expenditure? The candidate? The candidate doesn't get it directly. No. He gets perhaps the benefit of the money, you know, if there's a commercial on TV for him. We'll try it again. What's the difference between a contribution and expenditure with respect to corruption? Good. Is there is there a risk or appearance of corruption when you give money to the to right to the candidate? Yeah. What about an expenditure? With the expenditure not so much. Why? Why, why? why is the risk of corruption less with an expenditure? Because the money's already been spent. And it does not go to the candidate Exactly. Right. Thank you very much. With an expenditure, the money doesn't go directly to the candidate. It goes to a third party. A newspaper, or a TV station, a radio station, whatever, right? So the risk of corruption is less when the money is not going to the candidate, right? The candidate does not directly, that's what Jamar said, right? Does not directly benefit. There's an indirect benefit for sure. If there's a commercial on TV, he might get reelected for it. But because the money goes directly to the third party, not directly to the candidate, 
the risk is less, right? There's also another factor, right? So Aaron, if, if the government bans giving direct contributions to Jones, can you still support Jones? Sure. Yeah, how do we support him? Uh, you can give him like up to the amount of the restriction. Okay, but beyond that, how can I support Jones if I can't give him a larger contribution? I mean, you could you could fundraise, you oh. could work. You but what could... what's what's a common method of supporting a candidate? What might you do? Uh, put flyers on people's cars. Put flyers. What else? Uh, put yard signs. Yard signs. Yeah. What else? Ads. Ads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All that good stuff. What's the all? How much does that stuff cost? Those yard signs aren't free. Nope. Bumper stickers don't print themselves. Nope. TV ads don't run themselves. What do you need to do those forms of promotion? Lots of money and resources. You know what you need? Expenditures. You need expenditures. So the limitation on the expenditures really cuts off a much wider range of support for a candidate, right? Contribution is just one type. You give a check right to the candidate, and there's a risk of corruption. But with expenditures, the money goes to a third party. TV station, news station, et cetera, there's not that risk of corruption and it's a much wider category of speech restricting. If you say you can't even spend money on cardboard to make a sign, right? That is a much greater burden on free speech than writing a check to the candidate. And we'll see this, think about it. If you want to print up yard signs, you want to print up flyers, all these things Aaron said, that costs money. Those are all expenditures. So the course said that the restriction on expenditures is far greater, it's far more substantial, and limits your ability to engage in political expression. Right? Everything you do to support a candidate costs money. Just think about it, right? You print a bumper sticker, you put up a sign, right? You want to put lawn signs. That, that, that stuff's not free. It costs money. It's actually very expensive to do those uh, marketing things. And whenever working on political campaigns, this stuff, you need money. You need staff, right? You need people to knock on doors. You need poll work workers who will help with the polls. All right. So again, the big difference in the Buckley case was between the independent expenditures and the contributions. Because contributions go directly to the candidate, there's a risk of corruption. They can be limited. But because but independent expenditures are different, the money goes to a third party. There's not risk of corruption. And you can spend money on a far range of things. That restriction was far harder to defend and was unconstitutional. And the court said the ceiling on expenditures does not serve a governmental interest. And this is more or less strict scrutiny. All right. Help me out here. Everyone okay? All right, Julianne, so let me ask you this question. So let's say, again, you're a lawyer in the 1970s, right? And you read the Buckley decision. You're a campaign finance lawyer. You say, huh. So let me get this straight. The government can restrict how much I can get for contributions, but the government cannot restrict how much I get for expenditures? And again, you're a lawyer. You do campaign finance. What are you going to tell donors to start doing? Spend money for as opposed to spend. Yes. Exactly. Hear what you said? Don't write me the check, or you can write me the check up to the maximum, but don't give all your money just writing me a check. Give it to the expenditures. Uh, the Buckley decision perhaps unintentionally created a shift in the way political campaigns were run. It used to be, though, just find a couple people and say, hey, give me a million dollar check, we'll just call it even, right? And that, that'll be it. But you can't do that anymore. So now you need a larger number of low dollar contributions, right? These small contributions, the limit now is 2,700, was called hard money, right? You got these contributions directly to the candidate. But then you have the independent expenditures. And so all these high dollar campaign donors shifted to supporting these independent expenditures. Running commercials on TV, right? Printing newspaper flyers and the like. This became known as soft money, right? Again, the contributions were called hard money. 
and the expenditures became soft money. And oh, by the way, you give more money to not just the candidate, but the political party, you know, the Republican Party of Texas, the Republican Party of the United States, the RNC, and so on, right? All these various groups were formed to sort of <laughs> get around these limits. I, I kind of describe it, you know, money is to politics as ox oxygen is to fire, right? So long as there is oxygen, it will burn. And so long as politics is power, money will be attracted to it. So, I mean, not, this is not popular opinion, but I think all these efforts are kind of just silly. The, the money will find a way where it has to go, just indirectly, directly. Um, uh, DeSantis, who is sort of not in the race anymore, uh, created a lot of controversy because he basically delegated almost his entire campaign to various outside groups. He didn't do it himself. And uh, that allowed lots of money to flow in, but also it reduced control. So there's a risk when you let third party groups run your campaign because you're not in control of it. That's a political point, not legal judgment, but that, that happened recently. All righty, questions on Buckley? Yes, Shania. Sure. Oh, uh, well, they can save it for a future race. They can actually transfer it to other campaigns, which is often a way of rewarding their supporters. Uh, they can also repay debts. Very often, politicians incur debts when they uh, are running for office. They can repay debts with it. So there are lots of things they can do with it. They can't put it in their pocket. That's not allowed, but there's lots of ways they can spend it legitimately. You know, for example, I'm pretty sure that if uh, DeSantis runs uh, again in 24, he can probably transfer whatever left over. Uh, 28, he can probably transfer his left. I think I'm right about that. But the, the money doesn't go nowhere. You don't you don't return it to the donors. That, that that doesn't happen. I mean, I guess you could, but that that usually doesn't happen. All right. So okay, Buckley was 1976. We jump ahead until 2003. With McConnell, the FEC, and I'm sure you know this, but McConnell is the current majority leader. Mitch McConnell has been around since the 80s. Uh, he, he's never going anywhere. Um, uh, and this involves a piece of legislation that most people were not alive for, but I remember, which was the 2002 McCain-Feingold BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act, the BCRA. This was a huge law at the time between Russ Feingold, who was a senator from Wisconsin, and John McCain, who was a senator from Arizona. And they have this bipartisan uh, campaign finance bill. At the time, President Bush said, well, I think it's unconstitutional, but I'm going to sign anyway, let the courts figure it out. Which, OK, you can do that. Um, the BCRA did a lot of things, right? But one of the most important things the law did was to restrict soft money, this was in Title I law, was to restrict soft money to political parties. And the second was to restrict independent expenditures for advertisements. So again, Title I, the law, restricted <clears throat> soft money contributions to political parties. And then Title II restricted how much money could spend independent expenditures on advertisements. So Ryan, you wanna just walk me through the case, please? So, like you said, the BCRA, you know, the, they were looking at the whether or not the restrictions that the BCRA on soft money were constitutional. Mm -hmm. They found that the restrictions on soft money contributions were an appropriate response to the concerns about corruption. But because but why wh why would the soft money contributions create a risk of co uh, corruption? Well, you, they were getting the soft money contributions were being used to essentially advocate sort of the elections and mm -hmm. bring in very large amounts of money. And then mostly to political parties. Correct. Right. Okay, good. Thank, thank you for that, Ryan. The court said that the, that the limitation on the soft money to political parties was itself uh, uh, creating the risk of corruption. Even though, again, the money wasn't going to the candidates directly, it was going to the political parties, but the idea of giving all this money to the Republican Party of Texas, whatever else, and they give it to Ted Cruz, whoever the senator is, that creates the risk of corruption. So the court more or less viewed the 
contributions in Buckley the same way as the soft money contributions in McConnell. Again, the court said that the soft money contributions to political parties were not different than the political contributions to the candidate in Buckley. You want to see that? All right. Uh, Leighton, what about the limitation on independent expenditures? What did the court do there? Um, they basically also said that there could be restrictions on that. Why? Um, I guess because there was... What's an electioneering communication, Leighton? Wait. What's an electioneering communication? What does that, what does that mean? I guess communicating, advocating for a particular candidate during specific elections. Right. When under the law could you not communicate about election candidate? There were little restrictions on when you could do it. Uh, within 60 days. Of Very good. Right. Let me explain what's going on here. This is actually a little bit complicated. Um. If you want to put a commercial on TV within 60 days before an election, it costs money, right? We all agree. Where does that money come from? If that money comes from some corporation, the law prohibited accepting that money. You cannot spend corporate money on an election within 60 days of an election. You could use money from what's called a PAC, a political action committee, a PAC but you couldn't use corporate money. Amy, I'll come back to you, please. Why would the federal law prohibit spending corporate money on an electioneering communication within two months of an election? What's, what's the thinking there? Basically, the corporate power, to have power or influence over the candidate by participating in an advertising. Very good. The fear was that these corporations will basically buy elections by putting all these commercials out right before the, the election season. So the court upheld corporations and unions from funding these communications within two months of election. And they said that this would reduce corruption, and that would people wouldn't think that corporations are buying off the elections. All right. They used to assign McConnell, and in this edition of the book, we have just a little short excerpt because it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, because what happened next. So McConnell was in 2003. In 2006, the Supreme Court would change. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts replaced Chief Justice Rehnquist. And Justice, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, she actually died uh, last month, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor replaced, was replaced by Samuel Alito. Uh, one of the most immediate ways this shift was felt was in the context of campaign finance law. Because O'Connor had jointly authored the opinion in, in McConnell. She wrote it with Justice Stevens. And O'Connor had actually been an elected politician. She worked, she was, um, I think she was the speaker of the Arizona House. Don't quote me on that. She served in the Arizona legislature. Okay. So she perhaps knew firsthand what campaign finance looked like and worked like. Okay. I told you how O'Connor and Rank was dated in, in, college, in law school. Oh, it's a good story. It's actually it's even better. So O'Connor, the story that everyone knew is that O'Connor and Rehnquist went to law school together. And when they graduated, William Rehnquist got a clerkship with Justice Jackson. And Sandra Day O'Connor, I think was number two or three in the class, couldn't get a job because they wouldn't hire women lawyers. So she was offered jobs as legal secretaries, basically. She eventually made her way up. And then it was known kind of that they dated in law school. It was never known how much they dated. Apparently, they went on like dozens of dates. And then, get this, William Rehnquist proposed to O'Connor by a letter sent on Supreme Court stationery. Yeah, no Snapchat, no text. She got a letter. And Bates said, you know, Sandra, this is going on for a while. It's going well. We should go get married. And know what Sandra Day O'Connor said? He cried, yes. Nope. She declined. And uh, uh, she married John O'Connor. Um, and that oh, was a remarkable lifestyle, but but it was only known recently that O'Connor actually rejected his marriage proposal. That we didn't know that until fairly recently, um, but we knew they had dated. 
Uh, the other sad part is that O'Connor, the reason why she retired was that her husband was suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's. This is really sad. And she realized she couldn't take care of her husband while being on the justice, so she, she stepped down. And shortly after she retired from the court, her husband's condition degraded that he had to be put in a home and she couldn't even take care of him. And this is the sad part. She, the husband basically forgot about his wife and he basically found another girlfriend in the home. I know it's heartbreaking. Every time I tell this story, I want to cry. It's just so devastating. So she, I mean, remarkable human being. She left the most powerful position in the world. She was the swing vote on the court and she left that to take care of her husband. And then like a year or two later, she couldn't even have him in her house, put him in a home. And then just so Connor, herself later in life became subject to similar conditions and she's been out of public life now for several years and she died a couple months ago so remarkable person uh you know i don't always agree with her I usually didn't uh but just her life story was just stunning you can see where president reagan put her on the court um she would never get through today not a chance at hell but uh, uh <laughs> no no more o'connors but um you know uh you know, anyway there you go anyway so sam alito uh replaced sandra day o'connor in the supreme court and this case came up in, around the 2008 election, where I think most of you were in diapers probably. But the 2000 election was going to involve Hillary Clinton um, <laughs> and this guy from Illinois named Barack Obama, right? Everyone thought it was me, Hillary, uh, but it turned out not to be. <laughs> um, so <laughs> let me just, I'll play you guys a clip just for a moment from the group. Um, Citizens United is a uh, just it's a right wing group, and they make these sort of movies and other commercials that are critical of Democrats. And only okay, going go back. Oh, I know what's going on. It always for some reason it actually wants to output the audio to my Bluetooth thing, which is not a real. She's not a real microphone. Film entitled Hillary the Movie. Hillary the Movie. The film was a commentary on the career and background of then Senator. This Hillary is just Kennedy's voice. Who was a candidate in the presidential primaries. Oops, sorry. The point is, what are we going to do with all these illegal immigrants? Unless I miss something, Senator Clinton said two different things in the course. They don't use that word anymore. She's deceitful. She'll make up any story. That's Dick Morris. As long as it serves her purpose at the moment. The company wanted to broadcast the film in 2008, which was. Okay. So you get the idea, right? This is just sort of pure polemical speech criticizing Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, talking about illegal immigration. That's like a different world today. Um, uh, and they wanted to broadcast this over what's called video on demand, which. Is like streaming before YouTube, right? If you, you know, <laughs> it, it used to, remember you used to have cable TV, right? It's a little box and you have to press buttons in your remote, right? You could basically order a movie to watch on demand. Before that, you'd have to call pay per view, right? You know what pay per view is? You pay per view. You pay for each viewing. It's not like you just like uh, paper. You're welcome. Um, and they wanted to broadcast this within 60 days of the election. Now, if they had funded this through their PAC, there'd actually be no problem. And Citizens United did have a PAC, a political action committee. But instead, they funded it through at least in part corporation, corporate donations. Not a lot, but, you know, money from the corporations. The BCRA did not allow this. And in fact, in McConnell, they upheld Title II. So this is a case where they said, well, Sandra Day O'Connor, adios, you're gone. Hi, Sam. Uh, they basically just brought a challenge seeking an injunction. Um, the trial court didn't block the enforcement, so as a result, they couldn't actually run um, this case, uh, this movie, before the election. It's on YouTube now. If you want to go watch it, it's not very, it's not very good, but you know, it's on YouTube. Um, by the time this case gets to the Supreme Court, Obama's already in office. So why are we still even arguing about this case? Well, because they said the right to free speech was restricted, and they can challenge it. Uh, even after their preferred candidate is no longer in office. Okay, so questions. All right, so this is a Justice Kennedy opinion. And I don't know if you remember from con law. Uh, Justice Kennedy opinions often left a lot to be desired. Uh, he was very big on rhetoric and very low on logic, right? 
there was not uh, he wasn't very rigorous he didn't really care about tests he kind of just cared about big picture and, and philosophy and sort of principles and the like so if you want to read this opinion and find some sort of bright line rule or test it's not going to be there you're not going to find it but we'll talk about it i'm happy to talk about it i one year on a on a final exam i had something with justice kennedy and said sir this is a wendy's right uh you know the expression that sir this is a wendy's like give this long rant and he's at the wendy's drive through like sir this is a wendy's <laughs> anyway uh, it's, it's, it's... <laughs> all right so when this case was first argued it was march 2009 and it was actually shortly after president obama had been inaugurated and the first time it was argued a lawyer named malcolm stewart was arguing he's a very smart lawyer and Justice Alito came at him pretty hard. Let me see if I can find the clip. This one's just as painful to watch. Here it is. Corporate funded movies could also justify a ban on corporate published books. Oh, here, I got one too far. It comes from a corporation rather than an individual. During oral argument, some of the justices worried that a ban on corporate funded movies could also justify a ban on corporate published books. Justice Alito asked, the government's position was that the First Amendment allows uh, the banning of a book if it's published by a corporation. All right, so let me just sort of explain the reason why this question is being asked. Go back to my notes for the day, right? The very first um, question that I asked you to think about it is this speech is this speech. We all agree that a book is speech, right? We all agree that a book is speech. We all agree that a movie is speech. We all agree with that one, right? But what does it take to publish a book? Money. What does it take to publish a movie? Money, right? You need to hire actors, you need to hire cameramen, right? You need to hire editors. I mean, a lot of money needs to go into making a book. I think this is why, to go back to our question before, you can't view political contributions as O'Brien expressive conduct because the money is an essential element of any type of speech. Every book, even the Federalist Papers, my goodness, someone has to spend money to print them, right? This requires money. So Alito is making this point very directly. It's not like you're giving money to, uh, oh God, who was it, John McCain in 2008, the candidate for president. What you're doing is you're spending money to try to oppose Hillary, who is the leading Democratic nominee. All right. So putting aside whether you can ban a video on demand on cable, Alito goes, can you ban a book? Now, let me ask you, let me tell you something. If you're at the Supreme Court, which I will probably never get to, but if you're at the Supreme Court and the, and the question is, can you ban a book? The answer should be, no, Your Honor, you can't ban a book. <laughs> that's the answer but let's see what mr stewart says and by the way he's a really nice guy i've met him super nice guy uh but let's, let's see what he says malcolm stewart the deputy solicitor general candidly replied the election and communication restrictions could have been applied to additional media as well additional media that means books <laughs> so he's basically saying yeah you can ban books Justice Alito was taken aback by the answer. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. You think that if, if uh, a book was published, uh, a campaign biography that was the functional equivalent of express advocacy, uh, that could be banned? The answer was yes. The government's. All right, but I want to just, I, look, it's okay to dunk on Mr. Malcolm, and we do it every year in class, but why did he answer that question? If you say that, no, you can't ban a book, the answer is why. How is a book different than a movie? And the answer is it's not. So this is, if anybody didn't get to the Fifth Circuit argument this morning, this is an advocacy tip where sometimes you have to concede stuff and sometimes to hold the line, right? If he gave up books, he lost movies. So yes, he had to come up with a ridiculous answer, but he had to hold the line. Now, the case was argued about eight months later. Um, I know, actually about six months later when the uh, Solicitor General was Elena Kagan. 
who had been picked from Harvard Law School to become, she was the dean, she's going to be SG. Do you know what Kagan's first appellate argument ever was? This case. She never argued in the Supreme Court before Citizens United. And this is also Justice Sotomayor's first case in the bench. So lots of firsts. So when the case was re-argued, Kagan changed up that answer because she knew it was coming. This is, this is kind of funny. I like this one. Changed position six months later when the case was re-argued. Justice Ginsburg asked Solicitor General Elena Kagan. If Congress could say no TV and radio ads, could it also say no newspaper ads, no campaign biographies? Last time the answer was yes, Congress could, but it didn't. Is that is that still the government's answer? Well, she was, what did Kagan the say? The laughter Kagan answered. The government's answer has changed, Justice Ginsburg. <laughs> she added. For 60 years, a book has never been an issue. Well, that, that's not a very good answer, right? Because the fact that something hasn't been done before doesn't really tell you if it can be done again in the future. So Scalia goes after her pretty hard. The court was not satisfied with that answer. <laughs> Justice Scalia said, you write it too broadly. You, we're not going to pare it back to the point where it's constitutional. If it's overbroad, it's invalid. Chief Justice Roberts added, we don't put our First Amendment rights in the hands of FEC bureaucrats. Ouch. Ouch. Justice Alito was still perplexed by the government <laughs> standard. Now, in light of your retraction, <laughs> I have no idea I, where the government would draw the line with respect to the medium uh, that could be uh, prohibited. In the end, a majority of the court would not. So basically, look. Malcolm Stewart got all this flack, but he held the line. Kagan didn't want to get up there and be embarrassed, so she said, oh, no, we can't ban books. We can just ban movies. But Alito said, what's different? And there really isn't. So th this is a problem with the government. This is a common problem in constitutional litigation, right? We ask, what's the limiting principle? If you can do this, what can you do, right? Slippery slope arguments. And for that reason, I think Stewart was right to say, you, yeah, we can ban books. Sure, why the hell not? If those books are funded by corporations, we can ban them. Um, but once you sort of give that up, you're also going to lose because Kagan lost her first case argued for the Supreme Court. Plus a five to four. All right. So let's get into the into the weeds of the case. Uh, let me up to uh, Jonathan. Just, again, remind us, what was Citizens United trying to do that they couldn't do? What, what did they want to do here? Um. They wanted to uh, release the movie uh, video on demand. Right, but but what? How was that movie funded? This should help us out with that one. Uh, um, it was funded predominantly through uh, contributions from individuals. Yeah, individuals. No. Uh, in addition, no, not individuals. Who funded it? Uh, For-profit corporations. Correct. Good. So again, the money was the the film was funded through corporations. And they wanted to use those corporate funds to air the movie. Now, could they sell DVDs? Yeah, they could, right? Right. Could they broadcast it 61 days for the election? Sure. But they couldn't broadcast it during the election. So, Anna, was their speech rights actually violated? Right. In other words, couldn't they just speak in some other fashion with some other source of funding and have the exact same movie broadcasted? Why couldn't they just use money from a pack and broadcast it that way? Well, I guess they, they could have, but... Oh, why, why isn't it the answer, then? Um, well, I guess, this, was this the argument that packs they are just expensive to run and this was an easy to just directly third party. You don't have to go through all that administrative. There's the answer, right? So no one is actually stopping them from speaking. They're saying you just have to speak in a different fashion. Understand what I just said? Right. No one's saying that you can't run the Hillary Clinton movie on, 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 the, on cable. They're just saying that if you want to run the Hillary movie, you have to do it absent corporate funds. Everyone got me. All right. 
The problem, though, as Anna said a moment ago, is that there's burdens to this. If you want to establish a PAC, either you have to register with the government, you have to follow reports, you have to provide disclosures to the government who's giving you money, right? You have to say who's giving money, how much you're giving. They're, they're, they're costs, right? They're administrative costs. So it's not that Citizens United can't run the movie. It's they, they can't do it with the easier approach. So what they're really asking for is we want to run this film our way without having to go through all these hoops and, and jumping all these hoops. Jumping through the hoops, actually. You don't jump over a hoop. It doesn't jump over a hoop. You jump through the hoops, right? And this distinction really formed the basis of Justice Kennedy's opinion, right? Adi, what was like the, the basic core of why Kennedy thought this law was unconstitutional? What, why, what, what really bothered him about this regime? Their... But did it limit theirs? Couldn't they just do it a different way? They could do it in a different way, but it—I mean, it was harder, so it wasn't like. Who was money. treated more favorably? The money from PACs or money from corporations? The money from PACs was treated. I'm sorry. Yeah, the money from PACs was treated more favorably than the corporations. And did Justice Kennedy think that was permissible? Why? Uh, well, because they were treated. Economy, yes. Economy. Yeah. Okay. So this is Justice Kennedy's entire gestalt. Right? This is his entire ethos, right? He didn't like people being treated differently, whether it was gay marriage or homosexual sodomy, whatever. He liked people being treated the same. And if you could convince Anthony Kennedy that like people being treated unlike each other, then bam, you're going to win your case, right? There was a time, oh, thank God it's over, when he was the only one that mattered, right? You would write a Supreme Court brief. And you just put Anthony Kennedy's face in the cover. And whatever he thought, he talk about dignity, he talk about federalism, right? The battle days, right? As they would call them, right? Um, that's what you do. And if you can persuade Kennedy that people are not being treated equally, you're home free. So even though Kennedy was very um, amenable to the idea that democracy doesn't require corruption, like it bothered him so much, he repeated this point over and over and over again, that you can't treat PAC money differently from corporate contributions. You can't impose these additional burdens on PAC money. Everyone see that point? It's about the disparate treatment between you. That's what matters. All right, Nick, what about corruption or the appearance of corruption? Wouldn't a restriction on corporate money um, reduce the appearance of corruption? Uh, yes, it would. It would reduce the appearance. Of but did Kennedy think that was a valid interest here? Uh, if it was, then, then Citizens United would have lost. Uh, no. So I'll ask the question again. Why is the risk or the appearance of corruption not permissible, not, not a factor? Why, why does that not matter? Again, Money can come from the PACs, but can't, from the cor can't come from corporations. Oh, I think it was because the, it would, the money would still end up like reaching that meeting source. Would anyone on the street care? Uh, would anyone on the street think that there's more risk of corruption if the money is coming from a PAC or from a corporation? No. Uh, debatable, but can you think the answer is no? Right. So again, the court knocks out the risk of corruption. In other words, the money can come from source A. Why can't it come from source B? Everyone see that? All right, Cody. What is this anti-distortion principle? Anti-distortion principle. Good. <laughs> it was in the case. You're right. I'm glad you remember reading it. <laughs> I don't blame you. That's what I'm asking. I, it, it, it's not explained at all. I 
ka sa inyo sa lahat ng mga kapatid na ayon ng ilang mga What does distortion mean? Oh, it's not bad. Okay, I like illusion. Dylan, help us out. What's the anti-distortion principle? Again, if you're not sure, I don't blame you. Yeah. They don't really, they don't really explain it at all well. I think it's like the argument that the media companies are the corporations. Corporations are funding everything. So if you mute the corporations, you mute potentially everything. How is that different from the appearance of corruption? Okay. Jacob? Okay, so they were talking about how the media corporations were exempt from this operations can be rule. And I guess when you're talking about this appearance of corruption, it's because this legacy media is more respectable and so if they're speaking then it's probably not they're not corrupt or they're not they don't have this evil agenda but if you just let any old corporation speak you're more at risk to like i guess evil persuasions all right i think that's good that's good um let me try it like this with corruption or the appearance of corruption talking about money that's being either given to the candidate or being spent on the candidate's behalf, right? But here, who's actually getting the money, right? Who is Citizens United giving the money to? The answer is the cable companies, right? Would anyone think that giving a donation to Comcast or Verizon or whatever is going to create corruption? No, right? Um, giving money to Comcast or Verizon won't create corruption because you just, you know, giving money to a cable company, a media company. But the anti-distortion principle is different. That people with a lot of wealth can give all this money to TV stations and, and news stations. They can actually distort what people see, right? They can distort how people perceive their government, right? I mean, you know this. When it's November, every commercial on TV is for election. Every commercial on radio is for election. You can't go anywhere without listening to an election ad. I, I hate it, right? We all hate it. And so what there was a case called Austin versus Austin Chamber of Commerce, right? The Austin Chamber of Commerce decision said that the government can prevent this massive amount of wealth from distorting how people see the press and how they see the media, how they see political campaigns. Okay. Shania, does the does Justice Kennedy think that's a valid interest? Does he really even care about that? No. Yes, ma'am. They ruled Austin. Exactly right. Tell me more. Basically, the idea was that silence the corporation just because it's a corporation. Good. And that they still have some sort of identity and they should be allowed to speak how they feel. They are. Oh, we'll get to that in a minute. I actually skipped over that. I'll come back to that in a minute, right? Can corporations feel, right? I want to come back to that in a minute. You raise a very fair point. Okay. But the court overrules um, uh, Austin, Austin Chamber of Commerce, right? And they say, we don't care about this anti distortion principle. So, Dylan Cody, if you know what it is, it's fine because it's gone, right? <laughs> The court ruled it. So we're basically left with corruption and the actual appearance of corruption, the appearance of corruption. Those are the standards we have left. But merely allowing people to use their wealth to influence the public is itself speech. If I'm really wealthy and I feel passionate about an issue, I feel it's a run commercials nonstop. This is why in the wake of Citizen United developed these things called super PACs and these super duper PACs and other entities which can basically aggregate vast amounts of wealth to run commercials and TV and radio and now internet. Okay. There's also the issue that this is an absolute ban. It's criminal sanction. It's not like, you know, you can do this if it's really important. It's you can't do it at all. And Justice Kane does not like bright line rules. He hates bright line rules. So he says this is unconstitutional. Okay. So again, the problem is number one, 
you're treating the PAC money different than the corporate money, right? And two, they get rid of this anti-distortion principle that's not enough. And they get rid of that case, the Austin versus Chamber, Austin Chamber of Commerce case. Are with me? All right, now Shania was correct. I skipped over a question. I want to come back to now. This will be for Kevin. Kevin, why do corporations have free speech rights? How does the court explain that question? By the way, what's a court? Have you taken corporations yet? Yeah. Neither have I. And I've never taken it. Who's taking corporations? God bless you all. You're in the right class. Uh, I never took a single business law class in law school. Kevin, what's a corporation? You don't need to take the class to know this. Um, a, an organization that's arranged around some sort of uh, idea, usually around business. Um, the legal people that function as their own legal entity. Okay, that's good. A, a group of people function as a legal entity. Kevin, why do people take the corporate form? What, what's the reason why you might form a corporation? Why do people form a corporation? What's the you know, rationale? Uh, and the liability. Yeah, very good. Yeah, okay, you guys know this stuff. So, I mean, look, a corporation, just to oversimplify, is a group of people who create an entity around some common purpose. And Kevin's right, a corporation shields you from liability. So if there are any damages committed by the corporation, it's the corporation that's liable, not the individual investors usually. There, there are ways around that, but usually it's a corporation that holds liability. So uh, Eric, let me ask you a follow-up question. What's the argument that when people assemble in the form of a corporation, they no longer can speak or they no longer have first amendment right to speak to the corporation? Why, why would that be the argument? It's just as Stevens makes this argument. Why do corporations, according to the Stevens dissent, have less or different free speech rights than, than humans? Yeah, okay, look, you and I, we're human beings. We have lips, we have vocal cords, right? We can speak, we have hands. Can a corporation speak by itself? I know it's sort of like an abstract question, but can a corporation speak by itself? How? If I have an LLC charter on my desk, can I just start omitting words? I have a corporate charter right here. Can I just start speaking? Who speaks on behalf of a corporation? Uh, Officers, right? Communications director and so on. So I'll ask the question again, Eric. Why, why are the speech, free speech rights different from a corporation in person? Jamar? Uh, I mean, well, you can, cut, you can shut it down. You can put its investors in jail. You can put its shareholders in jail. Sure you can. Go look at Enron down the block, right? Yes, that building did not use Pronto Chevron. Why, why does a corporation have different speech? Or why would a corporation have different free speech rights than a person, human being, flesh and blood? Aaron, what do you think? I think like in a similar way that in these cases the court kind of of course, the question is the right thing between handing a person the money versus spending money for them. All right. Um, a corporation, corporations' interests may similarly be kind of obscured. What do you mean obscured? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I mean. I suppose corporate motives are can be or could be individual motives. Julianne, what's the argument that corporations should have different free speech rights than people? I think this is a, maybe you guys are overthinking this question. I think it's, you, usually, this is one that students usually jump on right away. Corporations can't themselves. 
So having uh, similar standards or similar, similar rules for something that can't itself be expressive. Right. Well, what does Justice Stevens say in his dissent on this question? Stephen spends a lot of time in this in his dissent. I mean, he also kind of agrees that corporations aren't human, and they don't. They're not human. That's correct. <laughs> they're not human. They're uh, something else. They're like an entity. They don't speak on their own. And right. To give them the same protection in the First Amendment as humans would be a radical shift in how. Okay, uh, very good. R Ryan, let me ask you a follow-up, please. Ryan, according to the dissent, according to Justice Stevens, when the Constitution was framed in the 1780s, did corporations have any sort of special rights of free speech? According to the dissent, at least. We'll talk about Scalia in a minute. Um, no. Okay, why not? Because they're not a human being. Right. Uh, Stevens sort of walks through history showing that when the Constitution was framed, um, there's no evidence that corporations were given free speech rights, that they were just merely corporate charters that existed. Uh, often corporations were monopolies. You know, there might be one tea company, there might be one transport company in the area, but they didn't have special rights to speak. Now, Leighton, how does Justice Scalia's concurrence respond to that historical claim? You can you restart it. That's fine. He said basically that it doesn't matter who is the speech. It doesn't matter who the speaker is. It's mm -hmm. the speech itself. Right. And Scalia starts with the text of the First Amendment. It says, Congress making a law abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't say by whom the speech is being communicated. And if you think about it, right, all speech is done through organizations, right? Uh, Any time people publish in a newspaper, all that says that's, that's a corporation. The New York Times is a corporation. If you want to put your commercial on TV, that's a corporation. It's virtually impossible to speak unless you do so in some sort of a, a, a collected entity. You can't do it by yourself, right? I mean, even if I guess you could buy a poster board by yourself and take a marker by yourself and put on a placard by yourself, that's fine. But once you have multiple people doing it, you have an entity, you know, a campaign, that's in the corporate form. And it's sort of a fun historical question. How do you do history? Stephen says there's no evidence that corporations had free speech rights. And Scalia responds, but there's no evidence that the free speech rights of corporations are restricted, right? It, it, it's sort of, it's sort of what, are you, what are you looking for with history? And this is one of these cases where even people who, are, who say they're originalists, as they look for the original meaning of the Constitution, uh, vigorously disagree. Uh, so the Scalia, Alito, Thomas concurrence on one side, and the Stevens, uh, 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 Breyer, uh, Stevens, Ginsburg, Breyer, and uh, Sotomayor just on the other side disagree on the history very strongly. All right. Now, Lee, now's your turn. Uh, the case was 5 4, but Justice Thomas didn't join all the majority opinion. Where did uh, Justice Thomas fracture off? Basically, didn't like the like advertisements. Not you're close. Not the advertisements. What did Justice Thomas disagree with about with the majority on? And the dissent. Actually, on this issue, it was eight to one. So on the issue I'm talking about now, it was an eight to one vote. So the disclaimer. And the disclosures, Layton. What are the disclosures? What what's going on there? What, what what must a person who makes contributions do? They want to make they want to give this money. They basically have to say like their name. They have to tell the government how much they gave. Okay. What does Justice Thomas see as a problem with requiring people to disclose how much money they gave? Um, basically, he says that like free speech doesn't rely on. What's the problem, though, by requiring? Oh, excuse me. What's the problem by requiring these disclosures? Why is it problematic for Justice Thomas? Um, 
Doesn't mean make like to um, like a historical argument of like Julius Caesar's. Sure. Why do people in the framing, you know, Publius, right? The Federalist Papers were written by those Hamilton, Jay, and, and Madison, but under the pseudonym Publius. Why do the Why do the Federalists use the pseudonym Publius? What might happen if you write something that's unpopular? Check my social media if you want evidence of this, right? What What happens? <laughs> hey, sure as hell don't. Yeah, yeah. Retribution, harassment, and the like. Just Thomas knows a thing or two about this. Um, Thomas says that requiring people to uh, d disclose who they contributed money to could lead to harassment or abuse. And he gives as the example what was then recent, uh, the, the um, uh, was it SB8? Um, the the, the same-sex marriage bill from California, where people who supported it, that is, opposing same-sex marriage, were harassed, they were attacked, they were targeted and the like, they lost their jobs, and canceled wasn't a term yet, but they were basically canceled. Right, that's what we would say today. They were canceled for for supporting or opposing gay marriage. And by the way, in California, the voters banned gay marriage, and the court said never mind. And the Supreme Court, in a weird case called well, Hongsworth versus Perry, complicated. Um, so Thomas would would say that you can't even require people to disclose how much money they gave. Now that was eight one. If you actually noticed that the, the uh, Stevens opinion was concurring in part, dissenting in part, what was he concurring on? He was concurring on the disclosures. He agreed. And Justice Kennedy likewise said that um, the disclaimers are permissible. And uh, Kennedy says, no one's prevented from speaking, right? You can still speak. You have to tell people how much money you spent. He also said, the, uh, you know, the, this ad was paid for by, you know, people for, people for the environment, whatever, right? Those disclaimers are also permissible. I think Justice Thomas would say that no, the government can't make you tell you who spent money on it, and they can't make you tell you how much money you yourself spent. But that was eight to one. Uh, only Justice Thomas took that position. Okay. Any questions on the Thomas opinion? Um, this is not really relevant to um, First Amendment, but um, Chief Justice Roberts wrote a concurrence focusing on starry decisis, okay? Drew a, a, a concurrence focusing on starry decisis. And Justice, Chief Justice Roberts made the point, right? Made the point that <clears throat> We don't always overrule precedent, right? And in fact, he says we probably shouldn't, right? We should defer precedent. But where precedent departs from reasoning, right? We don't have to sort of rationalize the past. What Roberts is saying was that the Austin case was itself a departure from the court's precedence, that the court had never treated differently people based on what type of speaker they were. So overruling Austin was not a big deal because Austin itself was a departure. At the time, everyone who read this thought, oh, he's talking about abortion, right? That Roberts, back in 2010, was saying, aha, Roe v. Wade is different. Because Roe v. Wade itself was a departure by making up this broad new right. So overruling Roe would actually be permissible. That's what I thought about Roberts in 2010. I, mean, I think I wrote about this at the time. But we all know with Dobbs what happened. The uh, problem is in 2012, John Roberts broke in the Obamacare case. He hasn't been the same since. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you uphold the ACA's attacks. You, you are a changed man. Uh, so this was Roberts circa 2010. Very different than Roberts circa 2012 with Obamacare. And Roberts are 2022 with the Dobbs case. But if you want to see what, why George Bush picked Roberts, it's this concurrence. Meanwhile, Alito joined the concurrence and he cast votes over rule Dobbs. He wrote the opinion. So, really, over the last decade, Roberts and Alito were, they should be really close. They've gone polar opposites. And now Alito, I think, is actually the leader of the court. It's not the chief anymore. Chief's in, oh, no, nominally in charge. We'll see what happens on Thursday.
Okay. Questions on Citizens United. All right, let me just try to recap a bit. Um, when we approach these free speech questions, there are just different angles that you can sort of approach it or lenses, whatever you want to call it, right? And we start by saying, is there actually speech? Is this speech? The court has said that political contributions is speech straight up. It's not expressive conduct. So we're probably going to be applying strict scrutiny, right? Categorical speech is protected. It's not like libel, not like fighting words. It's a protected category of speech. It's sort of a category unto itself. Um, you know, the Citizens United case, it's not content-based. It's not viewpoint-based. It's just a straight-up prohibition. It's not like saying, if you want to be critical of Hillary, you can't run the app. If you want to praise Hillary, you can, right? So there's not any, it's not any viewpoint discrimination. It's a straight-up restriction on how much you can give. And Justice Kennedy employs more strict scrutiny in this case. Why? Because PAC money is treated more favorably than corporate money. Right. All righty. Questions? Yes, Addy? If you were going to fix this, how would you fix it? If you were Sledgehammer. If you were, if you were to shredder. Anything. I'd have to put a lot of the U.S. code into a shredder. Um, I mean, look, it's a fair question. How would I fix it? Completely honest. If we wanted to be originalist here, I think almost all first amendment doctrine that has to go. It was about prior restraints of speech. All the stuff probably goes out the window. Um, there be a lot. I mean, I don't know that Schenck and Debs were wrong as original matter. I don't like those decisions, but I know that they're wrong. Uh, if we want to have greater free speech protection in society, we can perhaps amend the Constitution or create statutory protections. But I'm not sure that any of our First Amendment doctrine makes sense. I mean, is Brandenburg grounded in original meaning? No, they kind of just made it up. Is the Justice Kennedy? I mean, look, Scalia makes the case that corporations had free speech rights at the founding. Okay, that's fine. But it doesn't tell you what those rights were. Um, so if you if you want it to be sort of grounded originalist, I think a lot of this doctrine is like, by the way, pornography can be banned. Flag burning can probably be banned. Draft card burning can absolutely be banned. Cross burning can be banned. I mean, just, just go down the list, go through our semester. Uh, the government has much broader protections. Um, the court hasn't made much of an effort to reconcile free speech with original meaning. They just haven't, because we have all this other doctrine. They, they're starting to give it a go in the context of free exercise and establishment. But, but you'll see when we get to free exercise and establishment, it's very backwards looking. But these cases, there's almost no discussion of original meaning. It doesn't matter. So I would probably, if I had my druthers, which I thank God don't, I have to take a sledgehammer to much of the U.S. reports. Just, just smash it. It'd be easy to learn, because the answer is they can ban it. <laughs> Right, basically, Schenck and Debs would be correct. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure about Schenck and Debs, but something close to it, probably. Would you still think that Schenck and Debs was a? So you would only think it would actually be focused on prior restraint and not punishing after the fact. Like, and you think it would still be kind of that necessary and proper clause, you know, like. Right. There's there's a question whether Congress has the power, but then the states have broad latitude to restrict speech. I mean, for morality, the idea that that you know pornography and the like could be banned. I think you probably could. I don't think I'd favor that as a policy matter. But um, you know, in a world where you don't have the Warren Court, you can actually have policy debates about what you want to have in your society. But when you have all these tests and doctrines, it's not up to the policymakers, it's up to the decisions. Um, anyway, so that, that's that's my opinion, which is not very important. All right, what else? Okay, next class. We will be here a week from tonight. Uh, class number four. Uh, we will do your favorite New York Times against Sullivan, which is libel and defamation. Snyder against Phelps, which is the IIED, the intentional infliction of emotional distress. And something called time, place, or manner regulations, TPM, which involves a rock concert in New York, War be Rock Against Racism, which is a great name for a case. Okay, anything else? Have a wonderful week. I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Yes. Sir?